this type of sadness. Why do I feel like that? What did the Messenger tell us? To help us overcome this sadness. He would seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from sadness. There's nothing more beloved to the shaitan than you as a believer being sad. Every single one of them is suffering from anxiety and depression. When you feel that maybe tightness in the chest, is that what life's all about? Is it just that box life where one wakes up in the morning, my brothers and my sister, goes work 9 to 5, comes back and then starts watching Netflix series and then goes to sleep and then his whole week is like that. When things start going wrong, right? We start sitting around feeling sorry for ourselves. An estimated 83.4 million antidepressant drug items were prescribed. I can't leave the drugs. They keep me sane. Why am I going through this? Allah decree this, get up and keep it moving, my brothers and my sisters. Sometimes we just don't know what people are going through and we just don't do it enough. And she kept on looking at the grave and then looking at the Gucci bag. 3,000 euros in the grave. When we prioritize other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, expect a very, very sad ending. The happiness of one lies in أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إلا تنصره فقد نصره الله إذ أخرجه الذين كفروا ثاني اثنين إذ هما إذ هما في الغار إذ يقول لصاحبه لا تحزن إن الله معنا فأنزل الله سكينته عليه وأيده بجنود لم تروها وجعل كلمة الذين كفروا السفلى وكلمة الله هي العليا والله عزيز حكيم انفروا خفافا وثقالا وَجَاهِدُوا بأموالكم وأنفسكم في سبيل الله ذلكم خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون لو كان عرضا قريبا وسفرا قاصدا لاتبعوك ولكن بعدت ولكن بعدت عليهم الشق وسيحلفون بالله لو استطعنا لخرجنا معكم يهلكون أنفسهم والله يعلم إنهم لكاذبون عفى الله عنك لما أذنت لهم حتى يتبين لك الذين صدقوا وتعلم الكاذبين لا يستأذنك الذين يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر أن يجاهدوا أن يجاهدوا بأموالهم وأنفسهم والله عليم بالمتقين إنما يستأذنك الذين لا يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر وارتابت قلوبهم وارتابت قلوبهم فهم في ريبهم يترددون الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين بعثه الله شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا الله بإذنه والسراج المنيرا if we can try to move as forward as we can, uh, as you guys can see, there's a lot of brothers here, uh, and try to make space amongst yourself as well, because I know it's very, very hot, very, very hot. And Jazakum Allah Khairan, may Allah Azza wa Jal bless every single one of you guys on a hot, sunny day when you could have been maybe taking a walk in the park or going out for football, right? You decided to come here to sit in front of this miskin. Before I start the lecture, as our brother of Staz was reading, something came to mind. When I was in Medina, brothers and sisters, there was a period where I began to feel a little bit sad and down, and my morale went down. And at the time, I couldn't understand, right? Normally, when I was studying over there in Medina, every day between Asr, all the way till after Isha, I would go spend that time in the haram. 
Being in the haram, my brothers and my sisters, comes with a type of joy and sweetness that you can't put into words. And I'm sure every single one of you guys, when you go for Umrah, especially when you land in Al-Medina, you feel this type of tranquility that you can't find anywhere else. Even in Mecca, people always say this, right? I felt a lot more at peace when I went to Al-Medina than in Mecca. Not that I'm trying to say that being in Mecca is not peaceful, but we're talking about which one is more peaceful, right? So what basically happened was, subhanAllah, in exam period, um, I would normally spend my days and my nights inside of my room, right? Which is maybe around the same size of a prison cell. Again, I'm not trying to put you guys off. That's just what it is. It's pretty small. Exam period, I wouldn't go to the haram because I was the type of guy that would leave his university studies all the way up till the exam period because I was busy memorizing and studying other things throughout the year. You have to kind of like juggle between university studies and also what? Haram studies. So I tell myself, at the exam period, خلاص, no more haram, I'm going to stay there inside of my room to revise for the exams. And wallahi brothers, I began to feel this type of, right, uh, this type of sadness. Why do I feel like that? Right? It's many, many years ago, many, many years ago. So I said, you know what? Today I'm going to stop whatever I'm, I'm doing. Even if it is exam period, I'm going to go to the haram. I went to the haram. I sat in front of my Quran teacher and I told him, Sheikh, I feel a little bit down. My morale has gone down. There's a type of sadness that I'm experiencing, right? What do you think it is? He says something to me that I'm hoping, inshallah ta'ala, every single one of us can take away. When you feel that maybe tightness in the chest, right? He said to me, when's the last time that you read Quran? Said to me, Sheikh, uh, a couple of days ago because I've been revising for exams and this and that, and you know, you get caught up in exam period. He said, Now you have your answer. So I sat between Maghrib and Isha and I just began to recite the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing else. I put my phone to the side. I, I didn't have any internet anyway when I go outside of the university. But I put it to the side. And I just started reciting the Quran from the Mus'haf. I just started reciting, reciting, reciting between Maghrib and Isha. And Wallahi, brother and sister, I kid you not, almost instantly, I began to feel a change, right, in the way that I feel. I began to feel upbeat, right? This is what the Quran does to you, my brothers and my sisters. That's why we start our gatherings of the Quran, hoping that at least, you know, it can soften up our hearts before we hear the reminder. Your heart is a vessel. It needs to be softened up, right? And the more softer and the more tender your heart is, the easier the knowledge will find its way into that heart. As Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi mentioned, says, فَإِنَّ الْقَلْبَ إِذَا كَانَ رَقِيقًا لَيِّنَا كَانَ قَبُولُهُ لِلْعِلْمِ سَهْلًا يَسِيرًا The more softer your heart is, right? The more tender it is, brothers and sisters, the more you will find it easy to go into this type of heart of yours. Right? العلم فيه, you will find that the ilm will solidify itself in this type of heart. The ilm that we are in need of brothers and sisters in order to navigate and maneuver around the challenges of life. We'll speak about all of that inshallah ta'ala in a lot of detail. I know I'm going on a little bit of a tangent here. But I remembered as I was reading this incident, perhaps we can take inspiration from it. Right? وَأَثَّرْ Ibn Taymiyyah mentions, and then he goes on to say, وَأَمَّا الْقَلْبُ إِذَا كَانَ قَاصِيًا غَلِيظًا كَانَ قَبُولُهُ لِلْعِلْمِ صَعْبًا عَسِيرًا If your heart is hard and rigid, the ilm will find it, the knowledge will find it extremely difficult to find its way into that type of heart. Right. Allah tells us Right. 
the way of the believers is that uh, when they are reminded of Allah Azza wa Jal, it trembles their hearts. And when the Quran is recited upon them, it increases them in Iman, brothers and sisters. We can take from that that the Quran is one of those things that really, really ups your morale. And it removes a level of sadness, brothers and sisters. Right? That's inshallah ta'ala benefit from the beginning. My brothers and my sisters, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from sadness. From the du'as that he would make was, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-huzn or wal-hazn. Oh Allah azza wa jal, I seek refuge in you from having anxiety, from feeling sad, Right? And other things that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would seek refuge in. Right? Why is that, my brothers and my sisters? Ibn Al-Qayyim Rahmatullahi Alayhi, he tells us the reason. He says, because Al-Huzn, sadness, brothers and sisters, يُضْعِفُ الْقَلْبِ It weakens the heart. وَيُوهِمُ الْعَزْمَ وَيَضُرَّ الْإِرَادَةِ And what it also does, it affects your determination and it harms that which you set out to accomplish, right? وَلَا شَيْءَ أَحَبُّ إِلَىٰ الشَّيْطَانِ He says there's nothing more beloved to the shaytan مِنْ حُزْنِ المؤمن than saddening or the believer being sad. There's nothing more beloved to the shaytan than you as a believer being sad. So the one that realizes, my brothers and my sisters, right, and it internalizes this, begins to realize, my brothers and my sisters, that when we do feel sad, when we don't feel that, you know, excitement in doing acts of worship or to do that which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, then it's the shaitan that is carrying out his works. His works are in full swing here. Right? Came across these stats from the BBC. Just to show you, subhanAllah, the state that we're currently living in, my brothers and my sisters. In this article that you can find on the BBC, brothers and sisters, it stated the following. This actually really, really left me shocked, guys. Stated that nearly half a million more adults in England are now taking antidepressants compared with the previous year, according to NHS figures. That's shocking, brothers and sisters. And every single one of us should be concerned. And there's a reason why they're taking these antidepressants, which we will come on to later, inshallah ta'ala. The number of prescriptions for children and teenagers has also risen. From 2021 to 2022, there was a 5% rise in the number of adults, right? Receiving them from 7.9 million in the previous 12 months to 8.3 million. Imagine that, my brothers and my sisters. And later on, bi ta'ala, I will read out some stats that were carried out by a major research project into children's lives called the Cohort Millennium Project. You will come to realize why. These are some very, very concerning statistics, brothers and sisters. You're a young man and tomorrow you want to have children. And it's only going, getting worse and worse. What is it that's causing people now, right, to be on antidepressants? The article goes on to say, it is the sixth year in a row that there has been an increase in both patients and prescriptions. An estimated 83.4 million antidepressant drug items were prescribed between 
2021 and 2022, which marks a 5% increase from the previous year. There was also a rise of just over 8% in youngsters taking the medication too. From 10,994 to 11,878 among 10 to 14 year olds. And from 1,000 or 166,922 to 180,455 in the 15 to 19 year olds, brothers and sisters. The other day, was a Wednesday, or was it a Thursday? I was delivering my online class and I was sitting inside of my car. I don't do it at home because Taymiya will turn the whole place upside down. So I have to sit in my car when I do my online classes and my meetings. As I was sitting in the car, my brothers and my sisters, I seen so many ambulances and police cars in front of me, I couldn't see. I was inside of my car parked up. But I could see all these ambulances going past. At a street that is maybe, what, two, three minutes from my house. And then all of a sudden I see people running. But I was inside of the middle of the class. I, later on I found out that a 15-year-old Muslim, 15-year-old Muslim young man had... I, so I inquired what was the cause there's a lot of rumors going around the male lies will forgive the Muslims saying all sorts of things right but one of the rumors that I heard uh, or that I saw reoccurring was the fact that he felt lonely right he was maybe even being bullied in school right sometimes we just don't know what people are going through and we just don't do enough to inquire about the state that many youngsters are in. Right? We're going to come on to it, inshallah. There are other stats that I really, really want to mention. But now that we realize, my brothers and my sisters, that depression levels, anxiety has gone through the roof, what are some of the things that could help us maybe overcome this sadness and this anxiety and this agony that a lot of us might be experiencing. The first point that I would like to share with every single one of you guys, my brothers and my sisters, is none other than a tawheed. Right. A tawheed, my brothers and my sisters, is learning the rights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has over you. Right? To single out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that which is exclusive to him, ifradullahi bima yakhtassu bihi. And to stay away from attributing to Allah that which, or should I say, to stay away from attributing to other than Allah that which is exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. How many of us, my brothers and my sisters, know the rights of Allah jalla fi ula upon us? Right? How many of us have actually sat down to learn what are the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon me as a Muslim? Right? Our sole reason of existence, my brothers and my sisters, is none other than to worship Allah Azza wa Jal alone. He did not create us to become university students. He did not create us to become professionals or to even work. Not that I'm saying you shouldn't do any of these things. I didn't say that. But we need to understand and realize that my sole reason of existence is to worship my Lord and to perfect what He created me for. Right? Today you ask a young child about Pythagoras' theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. He will tell you. He has memorized the periodic table. C2O, H2O, this 2O, minus 2O. I'm just making things up at the moment now because I haven't memorized it. Alliteration. Condensation, evaporation, and all of the other shations, he has what? Mastered it. Wallahi ladhi la ilaha ghayra. 
There was a period in 2015, I gave eight khutbas on the trot. And every khutbah was the exact same one. You know why? Because I stood outside of the masjid and I began to interview some of the young children who would come out. So I grabbed them. We started having a chat, right? I asked every single one of them, what is the definition of Islam? Not a single one of them was able to give me the definition of Islam. But when you ask about evaporation, alliteration, condensation, straight away, periodic table, algebra, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Right? My brothers and my sisters, am I being unfair in what I'm saying? Am I exaggerating? Right? We don't know the basics of our deen. What are we living for, my brothers and my sisters? Right? What are we breathing when walking on the face of this earth? That's a sad reality. And then parents, right? They're blasting my phone. Please speak to my child. He's having doubts about his deen. He's on the verge of becoming an atheist. But why though? What is the root cause for this? None other than ignorance. They don't know anything about their religion. And then we take them to these universities that are breeding grounds of kufr, shirk, feminism, liberalism, secularism. And of course, the rainbow team that is extremely, extremely active. Hmm? Charging at vulnerable Muslims who don't have the tools to equip themselves in repelling these doubts that are going to come their way. People always message him saying, brother, I don't feel that connection with Allah Azza wa Jal. I don't feel that love. Why is it that I can't taste the sweetness of ibadah. My brothers and my sisters, not that I'm trying to compare Princess Charming to Allah Azza wa Jal Abadan, but let me ask you guys, right? Who from amongst you is engaged? Huh? Don't worry, no evil eye, huh? Who from amongst you is engaged or found a sister that he wants to get married to? None of you guys? Ajib. Are you guys alright? Huh? Huh? Go on. Yourself? Who put his hand up? Table. If you don't mind me asking, why did you specifically pick her over every other lady that you know of? Why her? What is it that you saw in her that caused you now to grow this love for Princess Charming? She's a practicing Muslim, good. Number one, what else? Say mashallah, guys. Allahumma barik. Don't give him your evil eye. Huh? Huh? Good family, what else? She's got wealth. You can take all of her money. Taib, <laughs> what else? Tomorrow when you come to find out that she prays at night, you're going to be like, I've hit the jackpot. Sahih. Qiyamul layl, qawwamatun bil layl. Sawamatun bin Nahar. And that is because you came to know about all of these different characteristics and qualities that this lady possesses, right? You have this inclination, this love towards her, sah? Now look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Laysa kamithli shaynu sami'u al-basir wa lillahi al-mathlu la'ala. Again, I'll make this very clear. Not that I'm trying to compare Princess Charming to Allah Azza wa Jal, but how. Is it my brothers and my sisters that we expect to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we don't know anything about him? Ibn al-Qayyim says, فَمَنْ عَرَفَ اللَّهَ بِأَسْمَائِهِ وَصِفَاتِهِ وَأَفْعَالِهِ أَحَبَّهُ وَلَا مُحَالَهُ Whoever learns about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his names and his attributes and his actions, right? It is a must that he's going to grow a love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La shakka wa la raib, my brothers and my sisters. We know absolutely nothing about the Almighty Creator. Right? And when I talk about learning about the names of Allah Azza wa Jal and his attributes, you come to his names, 
you learn about the sifa, the attribute that also comes with this name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the capabilities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And we'll take some examples insha'Allah ta'ala. Right? Also Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi says, فَالتَّوْحِيدُ يَفْتَحُ لِلْعَبْدِ بَابَ الْخَيْرِ وَالسُرُورِ وَالْلَذَّةِ وَالْفَرَحِ وَالْابْتِهَاجِ Having a tawheed, my brothers and my sisters, it opens the door of goodness and happiness for this individual and he will be at peace. Right? A couple of examples, my brothers and my sisters, of individuals who really actualize a tawheed. They learned about the name and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Rajab rahmatullahi alayhi, in one of his books, he speaks about a male and female Bedouin. So this Bedouin, this nomadic male, found this lady in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a desert, and he began to flirt with her, began to seduce her. وَقَالَ لَهَا He said to her, مِمَّا تَخَافِينَ why are you scared? نَحْنُ فِي مَكَانٍ لَا يَرَانَ إِلَّا الْكَوَاكِبِ We are in a place that nobody can see us except the stars. Only the stars can see us. She looked at him and she said, وَأَيْنَ مُكَوْكِبُهَا Where is the one who created these stars? The mukokib. أَيْنَ خَالِقُ الْكَوَاكِبُ وَرَبَّ الْكَوَاكِبُ The Lord of these stars, where is He? أَلَا يَرَانَا Does He not see us, my brothers and my sisters? فَكَفَّ الرَّجُلُ He withheld from doing any haram with her. She instilled within him the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al-Basir, al-Raqib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can see everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching over us. And he hit him hard, my brothers and my sisters. And he stayed away from that sin. Now when you're under your blanket, both old and young, male and female, you come across these videos and you think that nobody is watching. Look how we behave, my brothers and my sisters, when there is a CCTV in the building. And it's watching every single step that we take and every move that we make. How we would behave. Again, I'm not trying to compare Allah to a CCTV. But look how we behave. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who watches over every single detail. What is our response, my brothers and my sisters? Have we really internalized? Some of these names of Allah Azza wa Jal and the attributes that it comes with. Another example, my brothers and my sisters. One day, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu was patrolling the streets of Al-Medina. Him and his servants, they became tired so they began to lean on a wall. We mentioned earlier that Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi said, فَالتَّوْحِيدُ يَفْتَحُ لِلْعَبْدِ بَابَ الْخَيْرِ Right? That a tawheed, it opens doors of goodness for that individual who puts time and effort in learning about the rights that Allah Azza wa Jal is over him. Allah is most beloved to him. He learns about him and he continues. Look at the goodness, my brothers and my sisters, it brought this young lady. So Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu is leaning back on one of the homes of Al-Medina at the time. And of course, the buildings in that time was not built the way it is today. As you're walking past, you can hear the conversations that are taking place inside of these homes, right? So as he was leaning back, the mother, she instructs her daughter, قومي إلى ذلك اللبن. 
Go to that leban, go to that milk. And mix it with water. Ya ummah, she says, Oh mother. وَمَا عَلِمْتِ مَا كَانَ مِنْ عَزْمَةِ أَمِيرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اليوم Didn't you hear about the law that Umar ibn al-Khattab رضي الله تعالى عنه passed today? وَمَا كَانَ مِنْ عَزْمَتِهِ She asks What is it that he told the people today? إِنَّهُ أَمَرَ مُنَادِيًا فَنَادَى لَا يُشَابُ اللَّبَنُ بِالْمَاءِ he instructed someone to call out and the decision that they took was that milk should not be mixed with water. Ya Bunayati, she says, O daughter, قومي إلى اللبن فأمزجيه بالماء فإنك في موضع لا يراك فيه عمر O daughter, stand up. Go and mix that water with a leaven with milk. You are indeed in a place where Umar can't see you. And likewise, those that work with Umar, they won't be able to find out what you are doing. And look what she says. Wallahi, ma kuntu li fil mala wa fil khala. In no way am I going to obey Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu in public and then when I'm alone am I going to disobey him? إِنْ كَانَ عُمَرُ لَا يَرَانَا فَرَبُّ أَمِيرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَرَانَا If Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu can't see us, then indeed the Lord of Umar ibn Khattab is watching over us. Right. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala, I know he heard all of this, my brothers and my sisters. He didn't knock on the door. He didn't pull that lady out of the house to hold it to her account. He went home that night and then in the morning he woke up all of his children. to give them this proposal of marrying this lady that he still hasn't seen with his eyes. He heard her establishing a tawheed, internalizing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed her with to learn about the rights that he has over her. She is someone, my brothers and my sisters, who actualized as Samir, Al Basir, Al Raqib. Right? And she is applying it now with her mother, who's instructing her to do haram. There is no obedience to the creation if it means disobedience to the Creator. And she also told her this in such a nice way. Oh, mother. Not like what you see today, where one may learn bits and bobs here and there, and then he starts charging at his parents. It's not just the tawheed aspect that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu came to know about, but also the way she spoke to her mother. Right? And these are characteristics that you want in a woman, my brothers and my sisters. So next morning, my brothers and my sisters, he woke up his children and he said, who from amongst you wants to marry this lady? This young woman. He eventually married off his son Asim to this lady called Umm Amara bint Sufyan ibn Rabi'ah al thaqafi it doesn't stop there, my brothers and my sisters. We mentioned Ibn al-Qayyim says that Tawheed opens doors of goodness. Right? Later on, what happened, my brothers and my sisters? The daughter that they had, Layla, she got married and they gave birth to none other than Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, my brothers and my sisters, does not need an introduction. 
even though he was the eighth Umayyan caliphate, right? The scholars of Islam like Sufyan al-Thawri rahmatullahi alayhi and other than him, they considered him like the fifth caliphate after Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali. Like when the caliphate are mentioned, because the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, right? Alaykum al-Khulafa al-Rashidin al-Mahdiyin. Right? Upon you is to take as inspiration the four great rightly guided caliphates Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali. Even though caliphates came after them because of how righteous and how just Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was in his reign, he said, add him unto them four great companions, subhanAllah. Right? It all started with her learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then all of this goodness came out of that, brothers and sisters. Ibn Al-Qim rahmatullahi alayhi says, brothers and sisters, وَلَيْسَتْ حَاجَةُ الْأَرْوَاحِ قَطْ إِلَى شَيْءٍ أَعْظَمَ مِنْهَا إِلَى مَعْرِفَةِ بَارِيهَا وَفَاطِرِهَا The heart, the heart he talks about, he says, is not in need of anything more greater than the nourishment of learning about his road. And this is what's going to grant you al mahabba he says, and peace, and so on and so forth. And he says, there's no way, right, of learning about Allah Azza wa Jal except by way of his names and his attributes, because that's the only source of knowledge that we have of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is there anything else that we know about Allah Azza wa Jal other than what Allah told us from the names that he possesses, right? And when I talk about names and attributes, my brothers and my sisters, I'm not talking about these debates that people are having on Twitter, right? I'm talking about learning about who Allah Azza wa Jal is. These theological debates should not be happening in public, right? We should be more concerned about attaching the people to who Allah Azza wa Jal is, these names, and what does it consist? And how can I now apply this in my day-to-day -day life, my brothers and my sisters? How can it impact me, right? Just like it impacted that Arabiyah, that female Bedouin, and how she instilled within that person who tried to do haram with her, right? Even when you look at Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, when she locked him inside of that chamber, and she said to him, hey talak, or hey tulak, let's get it on, right? And nobody was watching. He turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Innahu rabbi ahsana mathwai. Innahu laif al-hudhalim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my Rabb. The scholars of tafsir, they mention, right? Here the Rabb could either be referring to his master who's been so good to him from where he was and where he allowed him to live and be brought up in. And others mention Allah. All of the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon him. Even though nobody was watching, he could have done that haram and he could have saved them a lot of trouble. Well, that's what we think, right? The trouble of this dunya. Forgetting about all of the trouble that could come to us in the hereafter, my brothers and my sisters. Right? He began to remember all of the favors of Allah upon him. Allah did this for me, did that for me. And now I'm going to throw it back at him. Right? I'm going to disobey Allah Azza wa Jal after everything he's done for me. Number two, my brothers and my sisters. Taqdeemu hawa nafsi ala haqqi Allahi Azza wa Jal. That which is going to bring about sadness, right? And cause you misery and agony. Is putting your desires and that which you are tempted to carrying out before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. This is going to bring us misery, it's going to bring us sadness, it's going to bring us unhappiness. Right. And when you do Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or when you fulfill the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
especially, especially my brothers and my sisters, when you find yourself in that predicament, you are being called to haram, right? Your friends are inviting you. It's only one time. It's only one time. Don't worry. Nothing is going to come out of it. Look what Ibn Rajab rahmatullahi alayhi mentions. ما قدم أحد حق الله على هوى نفسه وراحتها إلا رأى سعادة الدنيا والآخرة. Never does an individual, right, give precedence to the rights of Allah subhanahu wa taala over that which he desires and is tempted to, right, except that he will see happiness in this dunya and likewise the hereafter. And then you have the opposite. وَمَا قدم أحد حظ نفسه على حق ربه إلا وراء الشقاوة في الدنيا والآخرة. You do the opposite. You will live a wretched life in this dunya before the hereafter. You know, my brothers and my sisters, a lot of us may think that when we carry out sins, when we give in to these temptations and our desires, that the only time, the only time that we will have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when we meet Him on Yom Al-Qiyamah. Many of us think that. Not realizing that there are, that there are immediate consequences and the sins that we fall into and these kind of mawaqif, these kind of stances that we take, it will come back to haunt us. Right? The only thing that affects your tawheed isn't just shirk, my brothers and my sisters. Shirk, it completely removes it altogether. Sins, innovations, and then likewise, minor shirk is going to affect your tawheed up until there is nothing left whatsoever. That's the most precious thing to you, right? Holding on to your tawheed, brothers and sisters. Stay away from these three things that are going to contribute to your tawheed diminishing and then you feeling spiritually dead and empty. Let me read out a message that I received with my brothers and my sisters. And I received countless messages like this all the time. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. I don't know if you received this due to your following and large amounts of other messages, but I've been watching a lot of your videos and they've been helping me a lot. Shukran. I have a question. Look what he says, guys. I've committed a lot of sins in my past. I've struggled with women and drugs especially. I was in a haram relationship with a revert and she was an amazing woman. But I mistreated her. Some of us have this kind of mentality, right? Chew her like a piece of chewing gum and spit her out. Move on to the next one. And you think, right? You think, my brothers and my sisters, that these sins that we carry out are not going to come back to haunt us. It's not going to affect our mental health. Just our sanity, brothers and sisters, more than anything else. I was in a haram relationship with a revert and she was an amazing woman, but I mistreated her greatly due to her past and what she had done to or previous uh, prior to her conversion. So what I understood from this is that he would bring it up and then he would give her a hard time for that and so on and so forth. I've done a lot of sin in private over the years and I regret it deeply. So I decided to leave her for good as she deserves someone better and I could never marry a woman who or whom I committed all of these sins with behind her back. I've mistreated her so greatly. Now I use drugs every day and all day to deal with that guilt. In my heart, I feel so sad and miserable, right? And I want a good Muslima, a good Muslima wife. And I think Allah could never forgive me. 
So I use that, the drugs to cope with these feelings, but it's taking a toll on my life and it is destroying it from within. Extreme depression and whatnot. I don't know where to go. I went for Umrah last year alone. He went for Umrah. And I've tried getting close to Allah here and there. I've cut up all women in my life. But I can't leave the drugs. They keep me sane. Can Allah Azza wa Jal really forgive me? The guilt of the past haunts me. Day and night. I can't forget it. The zina has killed my soul. If I could just have an ounce of hope that Allah can forgive me and I could one day marry a good Muslimah, I truly change. But I have no hope whatsoever. And I live with issues alone. No one knows about my struggles. I'm truly sorry for this message. It is very long. And I don't mean to take your time. Shukran. May Allah bless you. And Jazakallah khairan. Wallahi alladhi la ilaha ghayru brothers and sisters. Just about every single day I receive a message like that. Right. Another one that I have here, please help. I committed a zina and now I'm pregnant and I feel absolutely ashamed and embarrassed with myself. I feel spiritually empty. I can't get over it. Will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really forgive me? I'm struggling to deal with all of these thoughts that I'm having and this pain that I'm experiencing. What can I do to overcome this pain? All right. When we prioritize other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, expect a very, very sad ending. This amazing statement that is extremely profound and touching. Ibn Taymiyyah says, وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ كُلَّ مَنْ أَحَبَّ شَيْئًا لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ فَلَا بُدَّ أَنْ يَضُرَّهُ مَحْبُوبُهُ Anyone who loves other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning he prioritizes whatever it might be over Allah. It's only a matter of time before they are left hurt by that which they prioritized over Allah jalla fi ula. All of these young sisters saying that they've been left heartbroken that guy made all of these promises. He said, I'm going to make you my Khadija. Right? Made all of these false promises. Gave her all of this hope. And she committed haram with him. He chewed her like a piece of chewing gum and then spat her out. And then he just moved on to the next one. What did Ibn Taymiyyah say? You prioritize other than Allah, you're bound to be left hurt by it. And we see it a lot also, brothers and sisters, when it comes to people who work in the corporate world, he doesn't want to upset his boss. I'll pray when I get home. Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib. He's going to pray all of it when he goes home at 6 p.m. On a winter's day. Right? Because the day is shorter, sah? And the prayers are a lot closer to each other. He hasn't even asked. He hasn't tested the waters. I don't want to displease him. I don't want him to think that I'm a Muslimic. Right? It's only a matter of time, my brothers and my sisters. Before he's left heartbroken, he put that guy over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his boss. And Allah azza wa jal is the provider for him and likewise his boss. Unfortunately, my brothers and my sisters, later on he's maybe sacked or they run into one another. They're each other's necks and he's given his marching orders. You tried to please him at the expense of Allah Azza wa Jal and this is how you're left now. And the examples are many, right? Remember my brothers and my sisters, we were created for one sole purpose. And that is, Allah Azza wa Jal is number one in my life, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is number one in my life. No one else, right, is going to exceed that red line. No one else. 
Allah is number one, everything else is secondary in my life. But today is the opposite. When I find time, when I find time, that's when I'm going to go and pray. Today, Champions League night, guys. Champions League night. Huh? What time is Maghrib? 9.25, I think it is here, right? In London. It's getting at the end of the game. Last 10 minutes. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. What does that mean? Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. Huh? Allah is the greatest. You're in that predicament. Am I going to continue watching Haaland? Huh? Kicking about some material on a football pitch when you know you need to go and answer that call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasten to watch success hasten to success we might not say it with our tongues but our limbs show that my brothers and my sisters would anyone here say that Haaland is greater than Allah Azza wa Jal huh, would anyone here say this if anyone did say it, you'd flip the table on him, sah? Because you're a good Muslim. No, no, I'm trying to tell anyone to do that. Are you brothers and sisters with me? You're not going to say it with your tongue, but your limbs show that. In other words, you are saying, Allah, you wait for me. When I'm done watching this football game, that's when I'm going to come back to you. Wala la ya jama'a. Hmm? It's at 9.25. The game starts at 8. Huh? By the time it's 9.25, it's already, what, 75 minutes. That's when it gets the most interesting. And you have to make that choice. It's times like that, my brothers and my sisters, when you get up and you turn to Allah Azza wa Jal almost instantly, you feel this type of joy inside of your heart that cannot be put into words. Walala. Hmm? This is just one example, guys. There are so many haram that we are enticed towards. Everything is saying to us, hey, telek, hey, telek, let's get it on, especially in university settings. Hmm? Someone may ask my brothers and my sisters, and I think this is very, very important that we mention. You're talking about sins huh? are going to cause you to feel sad. It's going to maybe lead to a hardness of the heart. Why is it that we see all of these non-Muslims, they seem like they're really enjoying themselves? Huh? They seem like they're living life. Yesterday I, I was with a very, very famous cricketer. I'm not going to mention his name. Right? Very well-known cricketer. Shall I say who he plays for? Huh? You guys into cricket? I don't know. I told him, I don't know anything about cricket. I just see your face going around. Huh? One of the questions I asked him yesterday was, you know all these cricketers that you play with, right? And likewise, footballers, one thing that I've gathered is that after they retire, they begin to feel extremely empty because they were used to such a tight schedule. They didn't even have time to think about their purpose in life. So they suffer from boredom. And then they begin to question their existence. Right? They start maybe turning to drugs and whatever have you. Do you sometimes feel like that? He said, no, I don't. And he is a practicing Muslim. Practicing Muslim. And of course, if you're practicing, you're going to be on top of your prayers. You're going to be on top of your ibadat. But this is something very, very common amongst these people who we might look up to. Right? You guys heard of Jesse Lingard, huh? He's played for West Ham. All right. Huh? What do you guys know about him? Is he a good player? You guys probably think that Jesse Lingard is living the life, huh? How much is he on? He said 200k today, mashallah. <laughs> huh? He was playing for Manchester United and he found himself on the bench. He went on loan to West Ham, sah? To here. By the way, are we close to the stadium? Huh? Not the new one. 
You guys are all West Ham fans. They're going crazy now, huh? Drinking. Hooligans. Sahih? And you're thinking to yourself, look how they're enjoying themselves. As for Islam. So restrictive. It's always tying us down. It's holding us back from enjoying ourselves, right? This is how we feel. Jesse Lingard, my brothers and my sisters, 120,000, oh, did he say 200,000, right? He says that he turned to drinking to try and take the pain away. What kind of pain, brothers and sisters? The pain because he's on the bench. The pain of being on the bench, guys, as he struggled to deal with his career at Manchester United. All right? Go and enjoy yourself. And that's what's going to bring you happiness, right? This is what we think. And here we're talking about not putting anything before Allah Azza wa Jal. It is going to bring you a type of joy that you cannot put into words, brothers and sisters. Have you guys heard of Jim Carrey? Who's Jim Carrey? He's an American slash Canadian slash actor slash comedian. You know what he said? I think everyone should get rich and famous and do everything that they dreamt of so that they can realize that it's not the answer. So that they can see that it's not the answer. Right? Islam, barbaric, restrictive. Huh? Yesterday, I came across a statement Right? Brothers, they send me these statements like using your lecture. So I'm going to use in the lecture now. Have you guys heard of that shaitana called Qadi B? Huh? She one time tweeted, You know what's so crazy? I was tearing the other day because I miss my old life. Sometimes having everything gets boring but I won't complain it's not about me anymore from the apparent you've got all these girls fangirling oh, oh. hmm alright I have a whole page on my iPhone my brothers and my sisters you know what it's called the lives of multi-millionaires I collect their lifestyles and where they go after they retire from football. Because we, my brothers and my sisters, get deceived by this kind of lifestyle that these non-Muslims have and we feel like we're missing out. We want to put all of this haram first, hoping that we can maybe become like them. And Allah Azza wa Jal what is thrown behind our backs. I'm nearly done guys, inshallah ta'ala, five more minutes. Have you guys heard of Tony Adams? You guys heard of Tony Adams? Sheikh M came, I know. Huh? Maybe our uncle is sitting there. Sheikh, have you heard of uh, Tony Adams? Sheikh, I'm speaking. Yes, yes, you. Yeah, he knows Tony Adams. As for you guys, you're all millennials. Huh? Tony Adams, my brothers and my sisters, was like the Van Dyke of back in the day. Guys, I know, I know. You guys are probably surprised, huh? How does he know so much? I know, I get my information. Hmm? Tony Adams has admitted to binging on burgers and milkshakes to fill the void on Saturdays. That's how he gets over his sadness. The 56-year-old ex-Arsenal star says even 20 years since he retired, he misses the match day buzz. And he admits sometimes gorging on junk food to make himself feel better. He said, I get a little bit sad on Saturdays, like today. I used to get a fix on the Saturdays, you get into routines. I'd go and have a Byron burger. I've never heard of that kind of burger. And an Oreo milkshake all of a sudden as a reward. 
Adriano likewise, for those who know him. You know, Allah, I'm very, very thankful to Allah Azza wa Jal. You know, my brothers and my sisters, once upon a time, I had trials for West Ham. I'm a bowler, guys. Huh? One of the biggest fears that my dad had was that Abu Taymiyyah was going to make it to professional football. Wallahi, that was one of my biggest, well, my dad's biggest fears. Really, really was. I was very, very quick, guys. Very quick. I would play on the left and sometimes in the hole. You guys know in the hole? What's his name? Bruyne? Huh? De Bruyne. De Bruyne. That's it. That guy. And also, I was very quick, so I was very talented. West Ham could have maybe won the Premier League if I was still playing for them, man. Huh? Now they just got to, was it? Conference League. Third tire. Huh? We was living in North London at the time, brothers and sisters. And at the time, I was very upset. I began to kind of feel some sort of resentment towards my dad. So I bought trainers. And then the night before that, I was showing my mother. So now I forgot it inside of their bedroom. Wake up in the morning, very early, to go for trials. It's like, where's my shoes? I realized I had to creep into my dad's bedroom. As I'm creeping, crawling, he wakes up. Mohammed, where are you going? He said, Dad, I'm just going to go football, you know, trial, training. My dad started a very long lecture. And by the time he finished, it was too late to catch the trials. And one of the things he kept on saying to me was, Muhammad, what I really, really fear for you is that you're going to start drinking. You're going to start living this type of clubbing lifestyle. Hmm? And it's going to absolutely destroy your life. Right? I speak to some footballers. I'm not going to mention their names. You know, the guys with the blue ticks. Abutemi is certified now, by the way, guys. Huh? It's recently. But yeah, brothers and sisters, you don't know how they feel behind closed doors. Wallahi al-Azim. Money cannot buy you happiness. It cannot fill that void, brothers and sisters. And I thank Allah Azza wa Jalla. I might not have the same amount of money as Jesse Lingard. Hmm? But I feel content. Right? I feel content. With whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me. And that is because we have Iman. We have Islam. We have our religion. Right? I'm going to share this one last story to you guys. Then I'm going to mention number three. Then we're done. Number three will make it quick inshallah ta'ala. I have a relative. who lived a very, very poshful, luxurious lifestyle. Non-Muslim, right? She was the type of individual, my brothers and my sisters, that would go on these shopping sprees where she would spend 10,000 pounds at a time. Or 10,000 euros at a time. Allah, la ilaha ghayru. I'm not adding anything, I'm not taking anything out. And she told me this personally. 10,000 pounds each time. Right. Gucci, Louis Vuitton, you name it. And she said she would cry herself to sleep even though she had everything that money could buy that she wanted. She was in a relationship and everything. Hmm. The mother Hassan, her grandmother passed away. She went to visit her grave and she found herself standing on top of this grave holding this 3,000 pounds or 3,000 euros Gucci bag. And she kept on looking at the grave and then looking at the Gucci bag. 3,000 euros in the grave. Picture that moment, my brothers and my sisters. And she's asking herself, is that what life's all about? Is that what life is all about? The 
The non-Muslims, my brothers and my sisters, they don't want to hear about something called death. It scares the living daylight out of them. One time I went all the way to Portsmouth, all the way to Portsmouth for a three-minute kalima, three-minute speech, guys, at a football pitch. The brother asked me, please come. There's going to be non-Muslims and just give them a reminder. It was around the same time when Christian Eriksen had passed out on the pitch. I don't know if it was the Euros or the World Cup. I try to make them understand it's live, just a game. Wallahi ladhi la ilaha ghayra. Right? It is as if they saw a ghost when I was given a reminder. Yes, on a football pitch, guys. How old was Christian Eriksen, 29 years of age? And he nearly died. So anyways, going back to his relative of mine. Hmm. This is how she ended up becoming a Muslim. Is that what life's all about? Is it just that box life where one wakes up in the morning, my brothers and my sisters, goes to work, 95, comes back, and then starts watching Netflix series, huh? and then goes to sleep, and then his whole week is like that, Friday night, you know, they do whatever they do, Saturday night likewise, and then Sunday night is in bed and then goes to work on Monday. Is that what life's all about? It makes an individual think, brothers and sisters. Right? And now, even though she doesn't have what she possessed before, she says, I'm extremely content with what Allah Azza wa has given me. Right? And that is because Allah is number one in my life. Even a lot of reavers, when you speak to them, especially if they were female and they were living that kind of reckless lifestyle, they feel absolutely disgusted about the kind of lifestyle that they had and how they used to spend their Friday nights and Saturday nights. And rightfully so, my brothers and my sisters. Are you guys with me? And rightfully so. It's a disgusting type of lifestyle. And this is what a lot of these people are going through, right? When they find themselves in these very compromising situations. All of these YouTubers, and I've said it multi multiple times, guys. Logan Paul, KSI, Justin Bieber, right? Even Fusi Tube. Every single one of them is suffering from anxiety and depression. They themselves have mentioned, and I remember sending this to my little brother. I was like, what do you think? I was like, wow, subhanAllah, they're living double lives. All of them are admitting we are living two different lives. The life that you see online is very different to the one that you see behind closed doors. Right. Allah is number one in my life, brothers and sisters. That's how we should be. And last but not least, and this one's very, very important. It is a rida بِقَضَاءِ اللَّهِ وَقَدْرِهِ It is to submit to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. Right? Shaykh Al-Sam Taym rahmatullahi alayhi would say, سَعَادَةُ الْعَبْدِ أَنْ يُسَلِّمَ لِلْمَقْدُورِ The happiness of one lies in him submitting to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. The Messiah told us, the affair of the believer, the Muslim, it is amazing. Right? Everything that happens to him, it is good for him. If he goes through a hardship or a difficulty, he's patient and that's good for him. When things are going great, he's thankful and that is good for him. Messenger is telling us, realize that, comprehend that, let that resonate with you, my brothers and my sisters. A lot of time what happens when things start going wrong, right? We start sitting around feeling sorry for ourselves. Sahih. What did the Messenger of tell us? To help us overcome this sadness. لا تقلوا أني فعلت كان كذا وكذا Don't say if only I did this and only I did that. and uh, No. Say قدر الله وما شاء فعل Allah decreed is get up and keep it moving my brothers and my sisters. Again, from the names of Allah, right? Is what? Al-Hakim. أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَحْكَمِ الْحَاكِمِينَ Isn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most wise, my brothers and my sisters? Everything happens for a reason. Whether we see the good in it or not, 
شيخ السلام تيم رحمة الله عليه mentions أن الله عز وجل لا يخلق شرا محضا there isn't anything that Allah creates that is purely evil nothing it is what's subjective he says right it is subjective depends how you look at it you could put a positive spin on everything Allah is all wise my brothers and my sisters how many a time my brothers and my sisters and I love using this example have we been in a position where we so desperately wanted and wished for princess charming you really desperately wanted her and you did everything in your capability in your power to secure her but it just didn't happen right and to make things worse your best friend comes along and he snatches her from under your nose does it happen without a shadow of a doubt? I'll tell you guys a similar story, right? There was this brother who was really badly wanting to marry the sister. The wedding day is getting closer and closer. And then guess what? He sees her sister walking past, falls in love with her, drops the first. What did she do? Because she was so overwhelmed with hasid, she went to a sahir, a magician, in order to carry out a magic spell. فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ Or between two loved ones. She couldn't bear it. Right? And even if you look at, subhanAllah, my brothers, this issue of hasad, it's actually a problem with Allah Azza wa Jal that you have when you envy another. Right? Allah gave him all of these blessings. You're envying it. You're asking, why does he have it? Why am I going through this? Right? What did Imam Shafi rahmatullahi alayhi mention in some lines of poetry? Ala kulli man kana li hasida atadri ala man asat al adab? Say to the one who's showing you envy, do you really know who you've disrespected? Asat ala Allah fi hukmih idha lam tarda bima qad wahab. You have disrespected Allah azza wa jal by questioning and contesting that which he has chosen. Because you weren't pleased and satisfied with what Allah Azza wa Jal decided to carry out. Right? My brothers and my sisters, Al-Rida or Al-Taslim bi qadaillahi wa qadri. To submit to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. One thing that is really, really going to affect you, my brothers and my sisters, in being satisfied with what you have, because the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave us a very important principle. He said, انظروا إلى من هو أسفل منكم ولا تنظروا إلى من هو فوقكم. Look at those who are less fortunate than you. Look at those who have less than you. Don't look at those who have more. What will that lead to? Huh? It will lead one to becoming more and more thankful to Allah Azza wa Right? It will lead one to become more and more thankful to Allah Azza wa Jal. Even the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi said in another hadith, وَرْضَ بِمَا قَسَمَ اللَّهُ بِمَا قَسَمَ اللَّهُ لَكْ تَكُنْ أَغْنَ النَّاسِ Be satisfied and content with what Allah has chosen or distributed for you. You are going to be the most richest of people, meaning that contentment that you're going to have. And because of you, my brothers and my sisters, right? Because he's saying, right, انظروا, look at those who have less than you with the eyes. And that will cause you to become content. And because we are not, my brothers and my sisters, doing that, and we're looking at all of these famous artists and celebrities online, what did I mention right at the beginning about depression? Right? It is at an all-time high. And you know where it stems up from? Or you know what the root cause is, guys? Because of what young people... And elders as well, but the youngsters, this is the most shocking part out of all of this. Their depression is at an all-time high. And it keeps going through the roof. Not lowering your gaze at that which you look at. Many people think, my brothers and my sisters, that you only lower your gaze, right? When it comes to looking at the opposite agenda, sahih? What do you guys think? Should you only lower your gaze when it comes to the opposite gender? Is that it? Huh? Today, not just the opposite gender. Huh? The same gender as well. Naam. 
Because of what he's leading to. But putting all of that to the side, what am I referring to my brothers and my sisters? The study is based on interviews with almost 11 to 14, 11,000, 14 year olds guys. 11,000 14 year olds, they were polled who took part in the Millennium Cohort Study, which is a major research project in the children's lives. Look what it concluded, and my brothers and my sisters, this is what, from back in 2015, seven years ago, now you can multiply it with a haraj. It found that many girls spend far more time using social media than boys. And also that they are much, they are much more likely to display signs of depression, right? Due to their interactions on platforms such as Instagram, WhatsApp, and Facebook. This is all before TikTok. Now you have one billion of the world population that is on TikTok. Almost 40% of girls who spend more than five hours a day on social media, they show symptoms of depression. Most girls with depression are unhappy with their appearance and 2.5 times more likely than boys to be dissatisfied with their weight. All because they didn't lower their gaze when looking at all of these girlies. Huh? And all of these celebrities that are idolized and popularized and portrayed as the ideal woman of how a woman should look like. Am I wrong to say that brothers and sisters? I tell sisters, stop following these celebrities. Likewise, brothers, stop following these celebrities and all of these other guys who are flashing their dunya. You're looking at it and you feel like you're missing out. I don't have it. So what does he do? He goes and starts doing haram in order to acquire the glitters and the glamours of this world. People are taking out haram loans because what? He visited a house that is so nicely built. I don't have it, but he does. Let me go and take out that haram loan. وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ إِلَى مَا مَتَّعْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِنْهُمْ زَهْرَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا لِنَفْتِنَهُمْ فِيهِ Allah told his Prophet عليه, to lower his gaze from what? From the dunya, guys. You're constantly looking at it and you're feeling, right? Sorry for yourself. I don't have it. He has all of that. And that causes you to become so ungrateful. Why does he have it? Why don't I have it? At taslim lima qaddarahu Allahu azza wa jal, brothers and sisters, to submit and accept what Allah azza wa jal has chosen for you. Go and look at all of those masakeen, those poor people in places like Syria and Turkey, guys, and the rest of the world, and what they're going through. Right? Allah stand. Allah is a sad state. Really, really a sad state. Those statistics at the beginning, they were terrifying, guys. That scares me of how they will be growing up. Especially with this happening to their children. That 15-year-old child that, that I mentioned right at the beginning. And a lot of the time, brothers, it stems off and the root cause is what we keep on looking at. Stop following these guys and we'll stop there inshallah ta'ala. I honestly apologize that I wasn't able to go through, you know, through all of the 10. Brothers and sisters, my humble advice to every single one of you guys is to learn your religion. Otherwise, you'll just see yourself going in circles and circles and circles all the time. Now, this little bit that we've learned, my brothers, is we have to apply it. We have to learn more about Allah and His names and His attributes, Right? In order to be a lot more conscious of Allah Azza wa Jal. وَمَنْ كَانَ بِاللَّهِ أَعْلَمْ كَانَ بِاللَّهِ أَخْوَفْ The more you know about Allah Azza wa Jal, the more my brothers and my sisters, you are going to what? Be conscious of Allah Jalla fi ula. Allah khayran wa barakallahu fiqh. Again, I just want to thank you guys on a Saturday huh? afternoon when the weather is so beautiful. Right, you guys came to sit here in the masjid. I ask Allah Azza to honor every single one of you guys. Sakum Allah khair for packing the masjid out. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.